one, Good evening, everybody, and welcome to PNP Live. I'm Lisa Muscatine, co-owner of Politics and Prose, and on behalf of my husband and co-owner, Brad Graham, and our fabulous events and marketing team, uh, we thank you so much for joining us for tonight's talk. Um, as many of you know, PNP is still closed to the public, but we are excited that we are we're offering a full calendar of live stream events like uh, the one tonight, as well as classes. And of course, we are busy selling books through our, our website, um, and one news flash, we're also now allowed to resume curbside pickup at all three of our stores, so we hope you'll be able to take advantage of that. Tonight, you can ask a question by clicking on Ask a Question at the tab uh, near the bottom of your screen. You can also read other people's questions, and you can vote for questions you'd most like to have answered. At any time during the event, feel free to click on the green button if you'd like to purchase more copies of tonight's hey. book. Um, I, I guess it goes without saying, but I will say it anyway, every purchase helps us maintain the staffing and infrastructure, infrastructure required to provide our, our web-based programming. Uh, you'll also see a donate button if you wish to support the store that way, and we are, as always, grateful for any and all of your support. Okay, now on with, uh, with the real business of the evening. Um, it is such a pleasure to host David from tonight for his new book. It's called Trumpocalypse, Restoring American Democracy. Uh, I just should say at the outset, David and I share something in common, not our party affiliations, but our past service as White House speechwriters. David wrote speeches for President George W. Bush and is widely credited with penning some of the 43rd president's most memorable lines. Let's just say that there's universal agreement among presidential speechwriters, no matter which administration one, one worked for, and I work for the Clinton administration, that David is simply one of the best at the craft. After the White House, David was a senior advisor to Rudy Giuliani's presidential campaign. That was in the pre-Trump era of Giuliani, and he's the author of 10 books. Now a senior editor at The Atlantic, he's been a pillar of the neoconservative movement for many years, one of its art, most articulate and most compelling voices. Even before David began writing about Trump, political commentators on both sides of the aisle lauded his fearless and ref refreshing truth-telling about the state of American politics. His first book about Trump, called Trumpocracy, The Corruption of the American Republic, came out in early 2018. It was a New York Times bestseller. And if you read it, you know why. Um, and you'll see when you open Trumpocalypse that much of this new book was actually written before the pandemic hit. That said, David was able to sneak in some critical analysis of the impact of the crisis and, of course, Trump's handling of it. Uh, hats off to him for stretching that deadline as far as humanly possible to be able to get some of the most relevant current uh, events into the book. David, it is such a pleasure to have you. We're really honored. I know you have a lot to say, and I know the audience is so very eager to hear from you. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Well, well thank you so much. Thank you to all of the team at politics and prose. Um, if you had any doubt beforehand how vital to American literary culture the independent bookstore is, I think you're in no doubt um, that we have we have seen that there are, there are many retailers in American life and they sell many different things. But the retailers who are specifically dedicated to, uh, to the book and what it means as uh, both artifact and content and symbol, um, that's, that's a special thing. And I'm so glad to launch this in-person part or as near as possible to in-person with, with politics and prose, where um, my three children spent so many, this is, I mean, I, these days I mostly buy online and buy from them and they've been delivering and they're great, but I remember so many happy hours in the basement there eating cake and um, with, the, with, with the children's books. And I know it, it, how much the store has meant to the community as well. And I wanna thank all of you uh, for joining. Um, I am, we are something of guinea pigs in a new era of discussing books and their contents. And thank you, thank you for being here. And uh, um, it's going to be strange to talk to an audience in this way without having your energy, your your human vitality as, sort of to, as my guides and, and my source of sustenance as I talk. But I'm going to try to put myself into in, through imagination into where all of you are and try to anticipate what's on your minds. These are such challenging times and, and even and I hope you are among those who have been spared illness. Uh, if, if you are among those, and I hope you are who are who are still in work, um, this is not easy for even the people who are having a more comfortable time. And just think how dreadful it is for the people who are sick, or whose loved ones are sick, or who are frightened of sickness, or are on the front 
front lines who've lost a job, um, and, and we think of all of them. Uh, um, my own institution, The Atlantic, we've been through some rigors. Um, we have, as those of you who follow President Trump's Twitter feed know, uh, we have had to um, reduce our editorial staff. Uh, we are widely read, but our advertising ha has shrunk, and that's had an impact. And I thank President Trump for doing his bit to drum up new subscriptions. I think we have sold some tens of thousands of t uh, today, so thanks to him for that, even if it wasn't his intention. I want to talk about um, this new book. As um, I said, th this is part of a two-book sequence, Trumpocracy and Trumpocalypse, and both of them came together in ways that are kind of different from um, the kind of long lead time you normally give to a book. Um, the, the first book in the cycle I wrote in the summer of 2017, at the very beginning of the Trump administration. And I began that book with a, expressing a concern, which is I was maybe writing too early to be able to give any kind of definitive statement. But at that point, the president seemed to be carrying so much before him. I, it seemed to me it was important to, at the risk of making mistakes, at the risk of emphasizing things wrong or um, mischaracterizing or misjudging things, it was important to speak early while there was still time. And, and this book um, was written over the course of that first term. Um, it is an, whereas the first book was a book of prediction, this book is a book of assessment. Um, it also is written a little before the point at which an historian would ideally like to write. The story is not yet concluded. We do not know what will happen in the election of 2020, but I wanted obviously to influence that election and to influence the world that, that came after. I want to say something about um, the title of the book behind me. And those of you who are looking over my shoulder, um, I, I'm a little anal about organizing books alphabetically by author, um, fiction on one side of the house, nonfiction on the other. And so um, it's, I'm not making an endorsement or any kind of commercial for Enrique Krause and Henry Kissinger. I just happen to be sitting tonight among the, among the Ks. Um, this, the title of Trumpocalypse, we use the word apocalypse in everyday speech to mean some kind of catastrophe zombie apocalypse, murder hoarder apocalypse. But an apocalypse does not mean an a, a catastrophe. It doesn't even mean the end of the world. Um, it's taken from two Greek words that together mean to unveil, to remove the garment off of something, literally. Um, and when the uh, Jews and Christians of the uh, first century of the Common Era began writing apocalyptic literature, these were works not of predicting catastrophe, although they did predict that catastrophe. These were books of revelation to show what was to come, how one order of existence would pass away and a new order of existence would come into being. Um, and they offered a kind of hope, a rather gruesome hope from our modern secular point of view, but still a kind of hope. And that's what I wanted to offer people through this book was to show that this order of things that we have lived through um, is coming to an end and something new, some new possibilities are coming to the fore. Uh, I did not, at the time I wrote most of the book, um, anticipate exactly this kind of apocalypse. Frankly, what I was expecting through the book was that um, the trade conflicts of the first three years would lead to a recession in 2020. I didn't expect a huge recession, but I expected some kind of recession. And I was very worried that the United States might stumble inadvertently into a, a shooting war with Iran, led by the president's um, instinct to do the easy thing and to imagine that there was some easy solution to the Iran problem that would get him into something that was much bigger than he intended. As happened instead, uh, the apocalypse did arrive and there's no exaggeration in calling this apocalypse. And it is this, this terrible pandemic that has taken at least 100,000 American lives and knocked nearly 40 million people out of work. Um, I uh, wrote this book, unlike Trumpocracy, in a long period of time. It, it took almost two years. And for those of us who write about the Trump presidency, one of the, the big problems is it feels like you can not only never finish, but you can never quite find your footing because crazy things keep happening. And uh, one of the... Um, one of the things I think that the reader often experiences is the, the shock, not of the new, but of the forgotten, because so many things have happened that seem so bizarre, and then they're succeeded by another bizarre thing. You will forget that the president uh, in the past couple of days accused TV morning show host Joe Scarborough of murder, because uh, you're, it'll, be just, it'll be overwhelmed by the next crazy thing he does. As you've may already have forgotten that President Trump tried to organize a giant military parade down Pennsylvania Avenue and was prevented by the military who didn't want to pay the bill for chewing up the streets of the District of Columbia and who didn't think it was a good way to spend soldiers' time. 
Uh, so there is there is there are moments of encounter, but there are deep themes here. And without recapitulating the book from beginning to end, let me talk tonight about a couple of the deep themes that um, might spark some conversation amongst all of us. I know we all have the book, um, and I, I uh, you will have your own thoughts about it. Uh, there there are many things in it, but let me talk just at the risk of being. Um, at the risk of not doing justice to everything, to a couple of, of, of themes that have occupied me. Um, the first is at the beginning of the Trump administration, there was an argument, and it continues, over whether or not the institutions would successfully check Donald Trump. And I quote at the beginning of the book a column that was written just before the election, um, one of those columns that the unfortunate columnist has to write before knowing the result, but that will be published after people know the result. And the column was titled, Whatever Happens, We'll Be Fine. And I quote that book, not to that, that column, not to single out a columnist, um, because many people thought similar things. I happen to disagree, not because I was so impressed by Donald Trump's cleverness or malignancy, but because I have for some time been more worried about the stability of American institutions. And I, I think one, one of the themes of this book is that um, the institutions did not do the job that Americans might have expected. Uh, that the American system, is, is a very old political system compared to uh, um, its democratic counterparts. Most democracies in the world are uh, came into being after World War II, um, some few after World War I. The American system of government, I mean, it's been through, of course, many dramatic changes, but it is very continuous um, going back at least to the Civil War and arguably to the 18th century. And because of that, it's full of things that no one would do today but that were done 150 or 200 years ago and that have stuck around. Um, I mean, in, in other democracies, it just isn't true that, for example, uh, the criminal justice system is staffed by political appointees. In Germany and Britain, they, they have directors of public prosecutions who are career people. Um, the president of the state or the home secretary, home secretary or the prime minister might sign off or the chancellor might sign off on their appointment. They're career people and they serve a fixed term and then they they go and they are selected from the ranks of career people and uh, they don't take orders from the political people. That's how it's done in most countries. And that's not how it's done in the United States. Uh, in, uh, most other, in most other democracies, um, th there are um, political apportionment is done by independent commissions or some non-political way. Politicians don't draw their own boundaries. Well, that's the way it is in the United States. Uh, and because so many of these institutions have been around for a while, um, we've gotten used to them. And we found even when they're not ideal, like politicians drawing their own boundaries, we've developed systems of adjustment. Uh, that These are the famous norms. Uh, norms are basically ways of making things that are not designed to work, work better than they should. And President Trump has challenged many of these norms and has discovered there's nothing really behind them. Um, and if you, you can't challenge them by yourself, one individual person cannot defy a norm. If everyone else were to agree that the norm's still in effect, well, then the norm would still be in effect. But if you can get a crucial blocking minority to agree, let me give you a very concrete example of this. Um, the main check on the executive branch is not the courts, it's not the Department of Justice, it's not the media. The main check is, is Congress. And Congress has um, powers to oversee what the executive is doing to hold the executive to account. Um, and the most important of those is the formal process of oversight um, hearings. And Congress, of course, is able to do this job in a way that no one else can, because it has the power to compel information, to issue subpoenas, and to say to the executive branch, tell us everything you know about this or that thing. Um, the subpoena power goes back to the very first days of the American Republic. And um, it has mostly been unquestioned. There has, there has been there have been periodic bursts of litigation about it, and uh, the law is pretty clear. Congress can subpoena pretty much anything it wants. It, it can't um, override um, constitutional guarantees. It can't dem demand that a private citizen hand over his or her diary. Uh, it can't demand um, personal information from private people. But its ability to get information from the executive branch is more or less plenary. And the rule is, or was, anything that Congress might conceivably legislate on, even if it had no present plan to do it, anything it might legislate on, it can demand information from the executive about that thing and expect to get it. Well, 
Donald Trump's administration has challenged that. And his basic view is, I will submit to subpoenas that issue from the body of Congress controlled by my party, but not subpoenas issued by the body of Congress controlled by the other party. And that this is a, I mean, presidents and, and Congress have tussled about subpoenas before, don't make any mistake, but the idea of a blanket refusal ever to submit to any subpoenas by the other party, this is something really new. Uh, and uh, so we say, okay, well, the, the, we're gonna have a battle about this, ultimately the courts will decide. But what Trump understood is if the president and Congress do not work something out, as historically they have always done, if the president says, I'm digging in my heels, the executive has the power to delay the production documents to the point where they don't matter anymore. And we are watching that happen with um, a group of congressional subpoenas asking for um, President Trump's business and tax records. And the president is, going, is fighting it with a view just to getting it past the election. The case went to the Supreme Court, was argued in front of the Supreme Court earlier in May. Um, it will probably be decided sometime at the end of June, maybe the first week of July. And my expectation is, is that the court will find some way to avoid answering the question, to um, uh, issue some kind of very general statement and then kick the case down to a lower court with a view of dodging responsibility and in effect handing a president a win that will protect the information he wants to protect till after the election. Is any of this illegal? It, it's not illegal. But we now have a new rule um, in, in American life, which is the president doesn't have to submit to subpoenas from the other party. And even if it's true, even should Vice President Biden win the election, and even should he become president, and even should he say, that's it, from now on, I'm complying with subpoenas. All he will do in that case is, is create a new norm, which is that Democratic presidents comply and Republican presidents don't. And that's not a very sustainable new kind of rule. Again and again, Donald Trump has pushed these boundaries. And again and again, it's worked, not in every case. And there are lots of things that a president can't do. There, there was a lot of loose talk early in the Trump administration about comparisons to Nazi Germany. And I've, I've always disapproved of that kind of talk. I've disapproved of the term resistance for people who are opposed to President Trump. From, from my point of view, if you're not in danger of torture, you're not the resistance. Uh, but there are a lot of stops on the train line of bad before you get to Hitler station. And you can corrode um, a liberal system, a democratic system, uh, w without reaching anything like the extremes of the worst such case in the history of the world. There are a lot of cases of democratic deterioration that fall short of those horrifying examples. Um, and the story of the United States itself shows, and this is a big theme of, of the Trumpocalypse book, that there are versions of history that are taught in which we talk about democracy as advancing from strength to strength. Um, there's the Jacksonian Revolution, which extends um, political rights to white men without property. Uh, it is followed by the Civil War and the post-war civil, uh, the post-war amendments, which um, end slavery, uh, which create civil, which bestow civil rights regardless of race. And then in the Fifteenth Amendment, say the right to vote shall not be infringed regardless of race. And then we, then we progress to um, uh, direct election of the Senate and to votes for women and to votes for 18 year olds and votes for the District of Columbia. And th this story is one where it's bumpy, but up, up, up we go. But that's not how it was at all. The right of political participation is always contested. And there are moments of regress as dramatic as the moments of advance. Um, and in Trumpocracy, I tell the story of what happened in the 50 years after reconstruction and how um, fewer votes were cast in the state of South Carolina in the 1920s than were cast in the 1870s. Um, in the election, many of you may have watched the plot against America, and um, where which purports to show a way that Franklin Delano Roosevelt could have lost the election of 1940. That was very unlikely. And it was unlikely because of his grip on the voting machinery in the South. The state He won the state of South Carolina with something like 95% of the vote. 50,000 votes were cast in South Carolina in 1940. Very few people, white or black, were able to vote. Um, we are always contesting this. And since 2010, we have been in a period where the right to vote is being contested. Uh, that has tremendous um, interest to me as somebody on the more conservative side of politics and um, a lifelong Republican and still a registered Republican. My policy preferences are um, on the right hand of, of center. Um, on a whole range of issues, taxing, spending, how business should be regulated, how the banking system should work. But I think it's important for the health of the whole community that right of center parties and left of center parties begin with this deal, 
which is we're going to sell our ideas, you're going to sell your ideas. The fact is, political ideas, they're never wholly true. They're always provisionally or partially true. Um, we advance by stumbling, by, um, by bumping off the bumpers and um, uh, cutting a zigzag course. But here's the thing we both agree we're not going to do. We're not going to compete by preventing people from participating. Uh, people are going to participate. Sometimes more will be mo motivated to do so, and sometimes fewer will be motivated to do so. But the idea, but once you are in the realm of saying we are going to shape the electorate to suit our ideas instead of suiting our shaping our ideas to suit the electorate, then you're moving out of democratic politics into something else. For a lot of reasons that I detail in the two book series, um, since 2010, it has become a much more live option uh, for. Republicans and conservatives say, we're going to try to shape the electorate instead of shaping our ideas. And you hear that very, very much very recently from President Trump, where he he's making it very clear. I don't think I can win this election if we have a lot of people participating. And that should promote some soul searching, not about election mechanics, but about you. If, if your ideas aren't competitive, if a lot of people vote, maybe you should think about developing some ideas that, that people will like more. Uh, that's how you know, the winningest political party in the democratic world is the Conservative Party of Great Britain. Um, it has won more elections over a longer period of time than any other political party. And it's done that not by being an unconservative party, it is a conservative party, but by adapting to its times, by adapting to its electorate, um, and by understanding that ideas that might have made sense in uh, 1920 are not necessarily going to make sense in 2020. And ideas that might have worked in 1970 might have been new and exciting and responsive to that time are not 50 years later going to be. You, you have to respond to the fact of change, the greatest fact of political life. Um, Donald Trump seemed to offer Republicans power, but he also offered them a dead end. Um, he led them into a cul-de-sac where they ceased to be a competitive party, and they have become more and more self-consciously an anti-democratic party. People forget that the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, the last one, was signed by President Bush in 2005. And he was a strong advocate of it. Um, we have now torn out the heart of it, it the Supreme Court did in 2013, um, in ways uh, they didn't dismantle it. And it, we can, they called for, they pointed out ways that the Voting Rights Act could be renewed. But the fact is, it's not, it, that none of that happened. And seven years after afterward, we are in an landscape without a voting rights act in which um, it's not in which voting favoritism gets ever more extreme and which in 2019 the supreme court said that partisan gerrymandering is okay well in america partisan gerrymandering always means racial gerrymandering there's really no way around that because the parties appeal to such different groups i, I want to move us to a world in which ideas are don't use don't use the, the method of disqualification as a way to compete if Donald Trump were to succeed in 2020, and I don't think he will, but if he were, um, the damage would be not just to the Department of Justice, not just to the principle the president shouldn't operate a business while president, not just to the principle that the president shouldn't take emoluments from foreign powers, although all of those will be out the window. What will ultimately be out the window is the idea that um, this is and should be a democratic country, meaning a country in which um, everybody is entitled to participate if they want to. Uh, meaning this is a country in which those who, that every worker is a voter. Um, that's the idea of democracy is that voting is not just for special people, it's for everybody. Um, all of that will be in question. But above all, and this is maybe the point where I will build to your questions, the thing that is most in question is the whole system of world order that uh, we inherited from the past, that um, Donald Trump has Every idea that made peace and prosperity for the world, not just the United States, since World War II, free trade, collective security, all of that is up for grabs. He doesn't believe in any of it. Um, and he is, uh, through this pandemic, we've had this extraordinary spectacle of a global crisis with no global response in which the world doesn't even look to it. It's not even that the world notices that American leadership is absent, although the, that leadership is absent, but the world no longer expects to see such leadership from the United States. And that's, that's a very frightening world indeed. When a world without American leadership is not a world that's going to self-order. It's going to be a world of chaos. Uh, it's going to be a world in which nation looks out for nation and in which um, uh, the, the strong impose their will on the weak. America has always led by consent. And that is a task more necessary than ever. And here's the last sentence on that before we take questions. Um, back when I worked for George W. Bush, now almost 20 years ago,
Uh, the United States economy was about three times the size of the Chinese economy. Today, 20 years later, they're neck and neck. Maybe the Chinese economy is still a little smaller, but that won't last for long. The day in which the United States could impose its will just by fiat, that day is over. If we're going to build a world that is safe for ideals that I think all of us watching this for taking part tonight share, we're going to have to do it by working with coalition partners, by working with friends, by leading by consent. Um, and Donald Trump's vision, I command, you obey, um, I speak, you applaud, that's not consistent with that with leadership with the uh, within the reality of the world we face. And so he is leading us to a world in which America does not lead and in which nobody is safe. So let me pause there and take questions. I'm so glad to be able to talk to you all tonight. David, thank you so much. And um, <laughs> there are about a million questions I would have just listening to you. Um, the first one is, um, is from Tom and a couple people are interested in, in hearing your response to this. The question is, you often reference the crisis in industrialized parts of the country as a source of tribalism and adverse electoral consequences. How do you think we as a country can revitalize rural America in an era of increasing urbanization? Right. Well, that's um, one of the, throughout the, the book, I talk about these conflicts between different groups as a, as a resource for authoritarian government. Um, and this clash between the concentration of production in uh, the coasts, in the big cities, and university towns. Um, I talk. I, I have a couple of ideas in the book, um, and interestingly enough, curiously enough, some of them take the form of answers to the problems of of climate change. Uh, we are not going to be able to um, carbon substitute our way out of the carbon problem. There, there's just no real. When you look at any realistic path for how quickly can we taper off the um, place in carbon in the atmosphere, it's just not going to happen in anything like the time that we have available. We're going to have to think very hard about how do we get begin to suck the carbon back out of the air. And the good news is that's feasible. It can be done. It's expensive, but it can be done. Um, but the way you need in order to do it, you have to do two things. You need a power source that doesn't emit carbon like nuclear power. And then you need to take the carbon you sucked out of the air, compress it to the point where it's a liquid, and then put it somewhere where it's not affecting the climate, deep onto the ground. Um, and so what we are facing in the 21st century is the possibility of a giant mining in reverse project, where we are using nuclear energy to suck carbon out of the air, compress it, and then re-implant it in the ground or underneath the ocean. Um, the places we're going to, we're not going to want to do that in Brooklyn and San Francisco. Uh, we're going to want to do that um, either in the middle of the country or on the sea coasts where we can put the uh, put, uh, put things un deep underneath the Gulf of Mexico, deep underneath the Atlantic or Pacific, according to where, wherever it's geologically safest. Um, so that I think is going to be a, a gigantic civil engineering problem of the 21st century that will create a lot of, uh, a lot of jobs in rural America. And I especially reference, um, I'll be blunt enough to say this, I'm very concerned not just about jobs in those areas, but jobs for men in those areas. We have seen a giant falling off of male labor force participation. Um, that's a big culprit in the rise of opioid addiction, in, um, in the uh, separation of families, um, in the decline of the birth rate, um, and in the declining life chances of the children born to people who are not in Northwest DC. Uh, so that's one thought, there are others in the book. Okay, great answer. Thank you. Um, let's just see here. Um, oh, uh, well, this was the first one that was asked from Tracy. How would you correct the loss of the independence of the Justice Department going forward? Um, you know, you yeah. talked about Congress being the most important check, but obviously the yeah. Justice Department is in the news a lot for yeah. not being such a great check at the moment. Well, I focus very much in this book on reforms that can be achieved quite quickly and without dramatic changes. Um, I didn't say this in the book, but I'll, I'll say this here. I, I think there are going to be about two years where um, it's possible to do some important reforms. I think there will be a Democratic president. I think there will be a Democratic House and Senate. Um, but as happened after 2008, I think everybody should bank on the fact that recovery from this pandemic will not be, let's hope it is rapid, but it may not be. And there may be a lot of disaffection in the country in 2022. And so no one should assume that um, things can't reverse very quickly. So how do you do this fast? With the Department of Justice, there are, there are pretty radical ideas, but here are a couple of basic ones. Um, you could just extend the list of civil service appointments to put the uh, Assistant Attorney General for the Criminal Division 
um, make make that person a civil service job and no, take them away from Schedule C. Um, it is a little bit more complicated to do that with the U.S. attorneys, but I think it's also should be feasible. I mean, I, I would like to, if it were up to me, I would move to a world in which um, the way you became a U.S. attorney was by doing a great job in your U.S. attorney's office. Um, and then you got promoted by the career person who was assistant attorney general for the criminal division to head. Uh, and maybe there could be a little role for some patronage. Um, that can be a way of like bringing some opening the windows and bringing some fresh air into stagnant bureaucracies. But the idea that these 93 prosecutors and the assistant attorney general for the criminal division are appointed by a politician for political reasons, that could be fixed. And it's really dangerous and it's very unusual in the democratic world. One of the places, David, I'm just going to jump in with one quick question that we've seen the sort of intersection of congressional oversight with this uh, trying to politicize the Justice Department, of course, or it, uh, the other, the federal uh, government in general, is in the the departures, the firing of all these inspectors general. Yeah. So what happens with that in your uh, perfect scheme? I don't talk about the inspectors general in, in the book. That is a, a place where I don't know there's a legal answer. That really is a norm problem. Look, the, the inspectors general um, are kind of odd ducks. They, they are products of the post-Watergate era. And one of the things that post-Watergate era did was it often blurred executive and legislative power in ways that then the Supreme Court would later strike down. So you have the, the with the inspectors generally, this one, they're executive branch appointees, but they don't exactly answer to the president. And I don't know what a Supreme Court and especially like a Justice Alito would ever make of them if they went to the Supreme Court. Um, so it's, that's part of the process of adjustment between the president and Congress. And I don't have a ready solution to it. But one thing that clearly is true is if Congress's oversight powers um, are reaffirmed, the inspectors general will be safer. And that begins, I think, um, by really pressing hard, whatever, however the Supreme Court ducks out of the Mazars case, the business records case, um, and punts it back to a lower court. We have to stay interested in this question beyond the Trump era and really reaffirm that um, Congress has the right to subpoena and has the right to oversee. And it, if the president doesn't like it, that's just too bad. And if the president says, I only want to ask, except answer nice questions, um, that, that's not how it works. And look, be prepared. M much of congressional oversight will be unfair, highly political. We all remember, um, you know, we don't have to think of recent history. There are many, many examples of this in American history of abuse of congressional oversight. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think when our lesson from the Trump years is even abusive, better to have 10 Benghazi hearings than never any business records hearings. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Okay, let's, uh, this is a more political question from Adam. Is it still your view that of all the Democratic candidates that ran, Vice President Biden is in the best position to beat Donald Trump? Well, look, at, at this point, I, I really, at this point, I, it's hard to imagine that uh, Bernie Sanders could beat Donald Trump at this point. I mean, the, the, at this point, this is a this is no longer an election that is about the challenger. This is an election that is entirely about the incumbent. I mean, here in the District of Columbia, we have the good fortune to live in an area that has been less hard hit by the disaster that's consumed the country than many places. We have a local employer who doesn't go out of business, um, and that's kept you know many people directly or indirectly in work. Um, we have a highly educated population. People spontaneously comply with masking, at least in the more affluent sections of the city. And we have, you know, a really a sophisticated and deep healthcare infrastructure for the capital of a great nation that is a, that is there to help even the more unfortunate areas of the city. But in Michigan, one out of five people has lost their job since the beginning, middle of March. I mean, it's a, it's a it's not only a scale but a speed of catastrophe never seen in American history. So I don't think presidents survive. Um, I looked it up the other day. The worst unemployment number of any president not actually to lose was Barack Obama in 2012. Barack Obama in November 2012 had 7.7% unemployment. Uh, but in the year before uh, the election, that uh, uh, there that there had been job creation, more people were working. There was people were disappointed with the pace of improvement, but no one could deny in November 2012 that things were improving. Uh, the second worst unemployment of any president was Ronald Reagan in 1984. He had 7.2%. But the economy was rising like a rocket between the end of 83 and the uh, end of 84. So it was obvious improvement was coming. We're going to have a situation in which I don't even, I, I don't even know that an unemployment number is relevant in the face. We're going to have, we have 38 million newly unemployed people in the United States. And let's say we have a great third quarter. 
how many of 38 million people can you pull back to work in a single quarter? 5 million would be astonishing. 10 million would be a miracle. <laughs> you still have a lot of people left over. And, and yeah, they may feel that in a year or two, I'll be back in work. Meanwhile, businesses are closing. Meanwhile, people have lost savings. And meanwhile, so many people are sick and or know somebody who is sick. So I, I, I don't think this election is about Joe Biden at all. And I think his big job is mostly staying out of the way. Um, he can, he's more likely to make a mistake than to say something will, that will do him good. Um, and my only piece of advice to the Democratic ticket is uh, take seriously the age of the presumptive nominee, take seriously that we are in a time of pandemic, and make sure that whoever runs with that nominee is someone who can do every aspect of the job, especially national security policy, immediately if they have to. And not just because if the worst comes, the supposing vice president gets sick and he's disabled for three weeks or four. Um, you have to be ready to have someone who can exercise a, the 25th Amendment in the way that it was imagined, not as a solution to a dysfunctional president, but because the um, there's a functional president who's temporarily ill, and you need a mechanism for governing while the president is ill. Um, and uh, so I, I, I hope that that, that is um, the, the running mate they choose, someone who is ready in case things go wrong. You know, it's interesting you're reminding me. We had David Pluff um, for an event for his book, which is really about encouraging people to volunteer um, in this election, in this campaign. We had him right before everything shut down. And he said something really interesting. He was asked, um, you know, who should Biden pick? At that point, it was pretty clear it was going to be Biden. Um, and he said it makes no difference at all. It's about the two people at the top. But the one thing people want to know is, can the person you pick step into the role? And obviously, yeah. as you're saying with Biden, that becomes a you know pretty critical consideration. Um, it, yeah, no, we, we, it, there's a disease going around and it hits older people. And so right. be realistic about that. Right. Um, you sort of answered this question, and I don't know if you want to elaborate even more, but um, Anne asks, what makes you say that you think Trump will not win the forthcoming election? You just said, you know, it's largely going to be a referendum on Trump. Right. Are there any other? I, I also don't think, I think the scale of electoral manipulation he that is required is probably too great to get away with in a way that the, like, there's, there's a lot of room to fudge elections in the United States and more than in most pure democracies. But there's always a limit. Um, and the scale of what, what he, he would need to do is just it's beyond beyond reach. Um, and the other thing we've discovered is that he doesn't benefit from any kind of rally around the flag effect. You're not much of that. So this idea that if he did start a war with Iran, it would help him. I think we've we we tested that in March. We saw during the pandemic, pandemic picked up before, before, sorry, we're getting sorry, some feedback. Yeah. Before things got really bad, really bad, he picked up three or four points in public opinion for three or four weeks. Um, there's not going to be a rally around the flag for him. So here's a kind of in the inverse question, which is what if Trump wins in 2020? You alluded to that earlier yeah. as well, but maybe you can elaborate on the what ifs. If he wins, we are on a path to bust up by the Western Alliance toward the end of the world trading system and toward a lot of corruption at home and a, and a lot of institutions at home. We all need, also need to worry about what if what if he loses and is um, resistant? Uh, and not just um, the moment of danger there is the moment from the election day till the Electoral College certifies the result. Once the Electoral College certifies the result, then I don't think it's, which is mid-December sometime, then there's not much he can do. I mean, even if he were to refuse to leave the White House, the, he wouldn't be president anymore. We'd, at that point, we'd have a squatter problem, an un, you know, an unevictable tenant problem. But the, the inauguration day is in the Constitution. You know, midday on inauguration day, Donald Trump ceases to be president and they take away the nuclear codes and nobody listens to him anymore. So even if he's, you know, high, locked the door of the bathroom on the second floor, third floor of the White House, um, and we're so all embarrassed so to do about that, he's not president anymore. And no one will treat him, as no one will treat him as But the period but from the, the period from election from to the certification, that's the danger period. And then once it is certified, he can still do a lot of mischief, including raising this question that we've never had to confront in the history of the country before, does the president have the power to pardon himself? Yeah, that's a fascinating question. Let's hope we don't ever have to test that, um, especially not this year, but um, it is uh, 
it is chilling to think about the possibilities. Um, Lisa okay. and David, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, David, if that uh, echo persists, it yeah. should stop if you're able to plug in some um, headphones. Oh, okay. I've got a pair of those right sorry over Sorry about that. No, not at all. Okay. okay just my just my oh. oh yeah, now I'm hearing you. That's much better. I should have done this from Great. Ready? Um, okay. Here is uh, Pamela asking, why didn't a decent Republican candidate get picked to challenge Trump in 2020? In 2020. In 2020. Um, oh, I, I'm getting worse oh, feedback I'm getting worse from feedback. because of the headphones. Actually, this has worked in before. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> It also might help also to let might help to love me. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Sorry, it also Sorry, might help, it also to might help to lower the volume. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, decent Republican um, challenge in, in twenty twenty. Um, Trump doesn't have the ninety five percent approval that he claims. That he claims. Uh, but he is broadly uh, popular in the Republican Party. Party. And. And most Republicans who dislike him, most of them have chosen to deal with that by exiting rather than by staying and fighting. And uh, I mean, through the first two years of the Trump presidency, there's this this joke cir that circulated, uh, never Trump, and the book is dedicated to the uh, conservatives and Republicans of never Trump. Never Trump isn't a political party, it's a dinner party. We saw in 2018 that that was not true, um, that the reason the Republican Republicans lost the House of Representatives in 2018 was not because the Democrats won extra seats in Brooklyn and the Bay Area and their historic strongholds. Um, they the Republicans lost seats in affluent suburbs across the country. I mean, they they lost you know uh, uh, Barbara Comstock's district here in, in D.C. in the D.C. area, which has been Republican for 60 of the past 66 years. They lost they lost Eric Cantor's district in affluent uh, suburban Richmond. Um, they lost George H. W. Bush's district that had been Republican from the time Bush took it in 1966 through Watergate, through Iran-Contra, through the Iraq War, through the Iran, um, through the global financial crisis. It was Republican from 1966 to 2018, and H.W. Bush's seat went Democratic. Newt Gingrich's seat uh, went, went Democrat. In fact, almost all of suburban Atlanta uh, went Democrat, as did suburban Augusta and suburban Savannah. Um, uh, so th those are all areas where um, people who most of the time vote Republican, or at least are open to a Republican message, especially women, uh, said, I want no part of this. Uh, so, the, um, but they they exited rather than stay and fought. And I think what, what happened with them basically was they, they, many of them crossed over, went into the Democratic primary and voted for the Democratic candidate who offered the most continuity with the past. And that was, that was Joe Biden. Um, here's one from uh, Tom. You often reference a recession of global democracy that began around 2005. Why 2005 and what events precipitated this recession? Um, I, did, I didn't pick the year 2005. Larry Diamond picked the year 2005. Larry Diamond is a scholar of democracy who um, keeps the records. And, and in fact, who also, if he didn't coin the phrase global uh, democratic recession, and he may have done, I don't remember. He certainly was the person who introduced the phrase to me. Um, and he... If you just keep tally of how many and what is a democracy, it's a hard question, but we can see there are spikes and declines. So there's a big increase in democratic governments uh, after the First World War. There's another big increase after the Second World War. There's another big increase after the end of the Cold War. Um, and then about 2005, things begin to go into reverse. Why does it happen? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, if I had to guess, part of what goes on is that the global economy grew quite strongly between 1980 and 2005, and then it began to grow less strongly after 2005. And so countries that were more on the cusp, one going one way or the other, um, they came under more pressure, their middle classes came under more pressure, and um, the middle classes were then attracted to authoritarian answers. I, I, this is not, uh, outside the United States, this is not an, an area where I'm comfortable speaking in great detail. It's an observable fact, what we can hope it's possible that one of the things that will come out of this pandemic is the governments that have done worst have been authoritarian populist governments. Um, Brazil 
may end up being the single worst of them all. We're certainly in the contention. Uh, Mexico is doing badly. Um, meanwhile, the countries that have done well have been countries that have maintain sort of more normal standards of of governance now new zealand is the i think looks like the outstanding winner south korea too uh, australia germany um uh, canada's done better than the united states uh, and i think there may be a feeling after this experience is over that people look around and say boy you know we need to learn something from australia and new zealand um and we need to learn stop comparing ourselves to brazil and mexico Okay, David, you may need a degree in psychology for this next one, but um, from Mike, the question is, is Trump's top priority to avoid responsibility, whether for a pandemic response or a lost election? Oh, um, look, I, I don't want to be an armchair psychologist, but um, like some of you, I've had the misfortune to spend some of my life in the near proximity of a person with a very severe case of malignant narcissism. And so I, I tend to generalize a little bit from that experience. But, um, you know, malignant narcissism is not the same as, as vanity. Uh, we often in ordinary speech will talk about a very vain person and say, oh, they're narcissistic. But nar a narcissist is self-involved, yes, but that's not what defines it. A narcissist is someone who's got a hole where the ego needs to be. A narcissist isn't vain. It's the opposite of, of, of vain. Um, you know, uh, look, most politicians have pretty good opinions of themselves. Uh, most successful people have pretty good opinions of themselves. Uh, but the narcissist actually front, wakes up at three in the morning and they hear a voice saying, you're worthless. Everything your worst critics have said about you is true. Um, you're garbage, you're nothing. And they then build this entire system where they cannot absorb any negative information because the whole thing, like, again, the, the, you know, the normal successful person can say, yeah, I've got a pretty good opinion, but boy, you know, who, who I now for, I'm going to forget who, I think it was Fiorello LaGuardia who said, when I make a mistake, it's a beaut. Um, and that I think is the normal outlook of successful people. They admit they sometimes make mistakes, they can face them, and then they, if you don't face them, how do you fix them? But Donald Trump can't. And so all of these things challenge, not just his record, but his fundamental self-concept. And the whole thing, the whole ego, the whole Donald Trump system is constantly on the verge of collapsing into this giant pit where his soul should be. And he has to keep it up at all costs because if he ever does collapse, man, there's just nothing left. You think it's getting worse and and why would it get worse? Is this sort of like a feeding the monster problem? I think it's worse probably the strain of the presidency. I mean, you know, we've all watched this happen that uh, I mean, Obama made a pretty funny joke about this at his last press White House press conference where he showed like pictures of himself um, at each press conference, and the last one was Tales from the Crypt, and instead of his head, there was a skull. Um, the president is unbelievably stressful. Um, you're responsible for so many things. You, you get blamed for everything, uh, whether you can could have done anything about it or not. And um, just the endless burden of care, and all the, even if you're as uncaring as Donald Trump, I mean, you still are aware that people are blaming you all the time. And the, the ratio, I mean, just think about how much flattery he got and how little responsibility he had in his old job as the star of The Apprentice. And now think about his life. Um, so I, if there is deterioration, I think there's, it's also, um, he doesn't take good care of himself physically, which is so important um, to a president. He doesn't have any of the supports, and I talk about this in the book. Um, you know, previous presidents, uh, many of them had faith in God to support them. Donald Trump doesn't have that. Many of them had um, the love of a spouse, historically a wife, uh, and um, someone they could just close the door and there's a person who's wholly in their corner. He doesn't have that. They had deep family relationships. He doesn't have that. Most of them loved animals and had had a dog or a cat or a horse or something, some, some you know, sim pair of sympathetic, inarticulate eyes who come home and, you know, stare into the Labrador's head. And, and he, under, he at least seemed to understand. He doesn't have any of those things. And most of them have had some sense of situating themselves in the history of the country. That sense, you know, that famous picture of John F. Kennedy with the, the windows where he's on the desk alone. And every president has hung that photograph somewhere to say, I, that there's John F., the ghost of John F. Kennedy saying, you know, we've all, you know, not many of us have been here, but the few of us who have been here have understood. And sometimes they even have each other. I mean, that, that there's an ex-president's club that presidents have turned to and, um, and especially that first ladies have turned to as a network of kind of just we understand what it's like. Uh, we understand what it's like when your kid gets into trouble uh, in the public eye and you can't talk to anybody about it. And 
um, and your opponents will use it against you, but the kid just wants to be a kid um, and is going to make the usual mistakes. That you, I, he doesn't have any resource at all. There is nothing except his own ego and his sycophants. That's, yeah, that's such a great point. I mean, we look back at, you know, at, 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 at Bush 41 and Clinton becoming great pals. And, it, you know, it's a small club, right, that they who yeah. understand what the job is like. Um, okay, here's one uh, from Sam. You just mentioned once he isn't president, um, at, oh, once he isn't president, no one will listen to him anymore. But what will happen to all the people who do still listen to him? Do you expect him just to be quiet, assuming he loses? Oh, no, I don't. Expect, sorry. I mean, correct this. Obviously, he's not going to be quiet. Um, dignified silence is not the Trump way. Um, but what I, I do think I've had pinned for a long time on top of my Twitter feed uh, motto, when this is over, nobody will admit they were ever for it. And I think if he's beaten and beaten badly, as I expect he will be, and if the Republicans also lose the Senate, as I imagine will happen. I'm not as certain about that, but I'm, I'm pretty confident that will happen. This this whole thing is going to look like a giant fiasco from a Republican point of view. And I think people are going to begin to think, wait a moment, if supposing Hillary Clinton had won in 2016, where would things be for the Republican Party? Well, if Hillary Clinton had won third term for the part for the same party in the presidency, that's always dangerous. The Republicans would have had massive gains in 2018. Um, and they certainly would have beat her if she run for re-election in 2020. It was a fourth term. That's just unheard of for the same party. And that would have meant that Republicans would have held power during the redistricting after the census of 2020. Um, and, and that would have meant that they would have been, the pandemic was coming and maybe Hillary Clinton would have handled it better, but it wouldn't have been perfect. There would have been a lot of unhappiness. Um, they would have been perfectly positioned. And anyway, she would have been president with a Republican House and Senate for two first two years. She wouldn't have been able to do much anyway. Um, and uh, and really, we'd have been way better off if, if, if she'd won. And we got conned by this guy who delivered us into a situation where how often do big progressive moments come along in American life? There was one in 1965. How long did... There wasn't another really until 2009. So on that schedule, you know, it's, uh, Republicans are safe until the 2060s for the, from the next bout of democratic activism. Instead, it's going to show up way earlier than otherwise predicted. It's going that, that 2021 and 2022 are going to be years where Democrats are going to be able to do things in a way that, you know, Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter were never able to do things. Hmm. Okay. Um, so following up on that is a, a, kind, a, a related question, I guess, um, which is from Maureen, who says, your prediction is that Trump will lose 2020, but many of Trump's supporters seem to be listening exclusively to propaganda like Fox News and so on. So it's not clear to me that they will blame Trump for his denial and incompetence in handling the pandemic or his many other failings. They, they may not um, agree with the critique of him, but if the prediction is correct, and I may be wrong, but if it's correct, or they're going to be in a situation where um, Donald Trump loses in 2020, uh, there are other losses too, and there's a census in 2020. And a lot of the appearance of Republican success in the 2010s came about because of the Republican use, their much more ruthless use than historically was the case of the census of 2010. Um, and just because the Republicans had done so well at the state level in 2010, they were able then to do things with the census of 2010 that just that neither party had been able to do in 2000 or 1990 or 1980 or 1970. My mind runneth not to the contrary when you had um, a, a use of census power as extreme as that which followed 2010. That's how we have situations where in a state like Wisconsin, a north of the Mason-Dixon line state, Republicans get 45% of the vote and like 65 out of 99 seats in the Wisconsin state legislature. That didn't happen by accident. Somebody designed that. Uh, all of that is going to come unraveled uh, after, after 2020. And whether or not anyone in the Republican world voices the critique of Donald Trump that I'm voicing, they will feel it and they will. the thought will occur, boy, I mean, that was not a good bargain. Now, they, I, don't, I don't predict how they may, they may double down. I mean, they may say what we need is a hardworking, smart, and less, less obviously corrupt and less obviously mentally unwell version of Donald Trump. And there's Josh Hawley and there's Tom Cotton and there's Don Trump Jr. for that matter, who um, is not as talented as his father and not as clever is not the right word, but it doesn't have the life force of his father, but also does seem to be, you know, a less obviously 
he will listen to advice. Um, you know, Dan Crenshaw from Texas, maybe you find somebody like that. I don't know, I don't predict the path forward, uh, but I do know that a lot of Republicans will um, feel that they were handed a defeat that makes what happened in 2016 look like a less good bargain than it looked in 2017 and 2018. Interesting. Okay, this one is gonna ask you to kind of revert back to your days in the White House. Um, it's from Robert who asked, as a speechwriter, you appreciate the power of the spoken word and it seems we're in a need of a Gettysburg moment, timeless words that recognize the new normal that we're in and where we're headed. If not the incumbent or the Democratic nominee, which elected official in or outside the US is best positioned to give us that and what should he or she say? Well, the Gettysburg address um, reminder uh, actually anticipates the point I want to make, which is that the power of speech comes about because of the confluence of speaker, words, and moment. And a lot of that is beyond anybody's control. So President Obama gave some very eloquent speeches after the Sandy Hook massacre. But you're not going to, uh, and they're, they're full of pretty good lines, but you're not going to remember them because the, they didn't come at a political moment when American society was ready for the change that he was calling for in those speeches. And so um, it I mean, sometimes happens that you can say something memorable when you're defeated, but when you're advocating a change that just doesn't happen, the moment isn't there. So I think a lot of things have to have to come together to give you the, those moments. I mean, Joe Biden is not a person of eloquence. Um, um, it's just not his style. I think his greatest political strength is you, you get a feeling from him of, he projects his feeling, of, he's a man who has suffered more losses in his life uh, than most, um, terrible losses, uh, children, wife, son, uh, son cut down. Um, and he's, he, he's suffered, and through his suffering, he's able to achieve empathy with other people who are also suffering. And Biden's best moments tend to be wordless moments. Um, uh, they tend to be a moment where it's just, it's just heart to heart. I think one other thing about communication is that we need to take very seriously that we live in the social media age and that the way that we could, you know, when Abraham Lincoln gave the Gettysburg Address, uh, most people never heard his voice They were, because they, there were no microphones and he's speaking into the wind. Uh, and so you would, that speech was spoken to be read. You encounter the speech in um, the newspaper uh, two, three days later, a week later. Um, and so it could be much more literary in a way that made sense and stopped making sense after the invention of the microphone. Then comes the invention of the television camera. And then comes social media, which captures us in these moments. So uh, human communication and human connection are indispensable to politics. But formal oratory, I think, is the product of certain technological moments. And we're in a different moment where things that are less formal are more powerful. I mean, you know, many talented people were talking about some of them, John McCall McConnell, Michael Gerson, Matthew Scully wrote eloquent words for George W. Bush a a through historic moments. But the single most powerful moment of his presidency was totally unscripted. And that was the moment when he stood atop the fire truck, picked up the megaphone, um, put his arm around one of the surviving firefighters and then responded to a heckle when somebody said, I don't hear you properly. And that was like just the moment. And it was, he could have said something equally good a hundred other days of the year and no one would have noticed it was that day. So it, it's the moment. Um, we are going to need one last thought on this. At some point, not yet, we're not ready. We're going to need a true funeral for the people who died, a, mo a single moment of concentrated national attention, attention on our collective loss. So many of the people who died were found dead in their apartments. Uh, they died alone. Um, and people, Americans are now much more prone to living alone than they used to be. And people often outlive their families. And the, the, um, uh, and this is not, these are not just a series of personal losses. This is a collective loss. So somebody is going to have to stand up to the job of at some day, six, I don't know, hope soon, six months from now, nine months, of whatever the memorial is, dedicating that memorial, whatever the occasion is, speaking of that occasion, and finding some way to give voice to the, the loss and grief that so many families have suffered. Yeah, David, believe it or not, we are um, almost out of time, but I'm going to ask you one last audience question. Um, 
and it's uh, it's kind of personal. Um, and and it's do you have a favorite mem memory from your time in the Bush administration? Oh my! So many, um, big and small. Um, let me end with one that maybe is significant. I, I remember um, uh, my last day working on the Bush administration. Uh, I did something that they just we'd never done. I, ha I had lunch with one of my colleagues, John McConnell. And we had a two-hour lunch, which is just not something that ever happens in the White House. Um, and we had in the White House mess, which is a lot less glamorous a place than it sounds, uh, and especially in those days. And then McConnell, uh, who's a colleague with this deep sense of history, he, he just collected people. And he had friends who went back to the Truman administration, um, just had known so many people. And he, we walked through every part of the grounds that we were able to go. And, and he just told me his stories, his memories, the people he'd known. And then we ended up um, at the um, elliptical curve in the fence at the South Lawn. And we stood there and we pressed our noses against the um, bars and we looked out. And we said, and I said to John, do you, do you think we'll ever see this view again? And he said, probably not. <laughs> I mean, he stayed for another couple of years, but I, probably me, probably not. And uh, I said, I just got to make it last. Um, so I remember that that view very, uh, very intently. Um, one other moment. Um, this is not as eloquent, but I, I do remember um, before 9-11 when the standards were a little looser, smuggling my, I had at that point two children, smuggling the two older kids in on a Saturday afternoon so they could keep me company while I worked. I, I, I often felt starved for their company. Um, and they were supposed to stay in my office. I mean, I'd broken the rules already. They were supposed to stay in my office. And then I went to the bathroom. I got distracted. The phone rang or something. And, and suddenly they were gone. And I, I didn't worry they'd gone missing, but they were gone. And I knew that was not good um, to have, how old were they? Been? It was like six, four, wandering through uh, the White House complex. And they didn't have a badge. Uh, and so I hunted them. And eventually I found them. And they were with the Secret Service agent who walked the president's dogs. And instead of turning them in, he had allowed them to throw the ball with the president's dog. And uh, maybe it was a way of getting out of his job. <laughs> but in any case, they had half an hour of, th of throwing the ball to President Bush's dogs. And they, to this day, they, they remember that as probably their most magical White House moment. That's a great, uh, that's a great visual. And I'm sure it has provided a lot of cocktail and other conversation for them with their friends. That's great. Well, David, we can't thank you enough. Uh, everybody, this is, you see it behind David. This is the book. Uh, I know most of you have copies of it already. Please buy it for your family and friends. Um, everybody has time to read right now. Um, but I just want to say, um, as a former speechwriter to another former speechwriter, um, you know, thank you for all your service to our country and to the government and to the values that whatever political stripe we, we wear, I think we all hold dear and, um, are worried about losing. And so uh, you've been such an eloquent voice on behalf of American values and institutions uh, and during a very, very difficult period. I especially appreciate your really kind and humane thoughts regarding the people suffering now. We should all always keep those people close to our, our hearts and in our minds. And um, congratulations again on your book. Uh, we will have you back to the real PNP in person. So because I'm sure there will be a next one. Um, but uh, thank you all uh, in the audience for joining and thank you for your great questions. And uh, we hope everybody will stay well and stay well read. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.